looks like we have Dave and Judy on now, right? Did they have anything to uh, bring up for prayer or any announcements that they wanted to share because they missed that first part? No? All right, so this morning, and uh, as we prepare our hearts for worship, I wanted to share with you Ephesians, a passage from Ephesians. And it's uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is great news. This is uh, the news that the Lord wants to bless the world with. This is why Jesus came, so that we would have salvation through him and that there was not, we were in a helpless state. There was nothing we could do to help ourselves. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And what he's come to do is to give us this opportunity. And he wants to bless his people through this. You notice it wasn't anything about blessing the world. It wasn't about blessing everyone in general. It was about blessing his people. Now we as his people can bring blessings to the world. He would bring blessings through us. Let's get that gospel out. Let's be used by God. Let's make ourselves available so that we can be the instruments that's going to bring peace to the world. That's going to bring light, intelligence, uh, advancements, all these things that we uh, have traditionally been part of as a church. We can continue to do this. Let's not lose heart because of what you hear, the way tide's turning. Uh, nothing is more powerful than our God and His will and His perfect plan. And uh, we are in a great position to be used of God right now. So, Let's sing about his wonderful grace. Let's turn, let's take your hymnals and start with number uh, 197, Lamb of Glory. Please stand with me. Thank you. 
please pass on to Anne that we really miss her, Terry. I miss her alto voice coming from this yeah. side. <laughs> and you're sorry, but you're no substitute for, for that. You, you, God bless you. You're, you're doing your best. All right. Uh, 198. Uh, this song is a song that you know we love here in this church. And uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, I think it was you guys that sent me the, the clip on YouTube or something. Yeah. where this guy was doing all parts by himself. It was yeah. great. It was, it was really awesome. something. Yeah. It'd be nice to be able to do that kind of um, harmony here, but <laughs> this is a great church, a uh, great song that we love to sing in the church, so let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's uh, worship the Lord with it. Oh, 
203. And can it be?
for sharing your gifts this morning. It was very awesome, I must say. Just very awesome. Nice song selections. Loved it. And uh, without having Granny beside me, I agree. I don't know what where, what do I say or when <laughs> on the singing. She is really good at it. So we are looking at, um, before I start though this morning, uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands or everybody remembers uh, that the Christians, uh, Kirsten's uh, prayer request for the Denver churches kind of brings that to mind. There are churches across America that are uh, meeting in spite of uh, what their governors are saying and, and whatnot. And some of them, I know, um, I think Gus, you were bringing up today that uh, uh, John MacArthur's church, uh, he is under a fine now of like $100,000, six digit fine for simply meeting as a church. Uh, lots of churches out there are fighting our fight for freedom to worship. So let's remember them in prayer. Uh, always remember them in prayer. It's very important, um, uh, critical stuff. So uh, we would be remiss if we don't, because our turn's coming. If we don't, our turn is coming, and it may be coming even if we do. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as the way things go, sometimes there's an advantage to being the way we are, uh, outside of town um, and smaller, um, when we when we built our sunroom, we we had an idea somewhere down the road it may become our church. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and that could be. We've used it before. Uh, when COVID started, we were a few of us there, and we may be back to that someday. Who knows? Um, but anyway, my, we are we are talking about a subject that is extremely important uh, to all of us. To me too. Uh, and that is our little ones, when they pass, where do they go? And my goal from the beginning was not, when we talked about heaven, on this whole series on heaven, it wasn't simply to satisfy our curiosities or, or have deep theological discussions about heaven. That's all well and good in the academic world, but to me that doesn't work in real life. I want a faith that works in real life, practical, that I can live with day to day, that guides me through my through, my, uh, through every day of my life. I believe that Jesus Christ gave us all the truths that we have talked about regarding the future, really, so that we will change our lives right now. Nothing can be more relevant to us than how we live our lives today. Nothing can be more applicable to us today than our view of life tomorrow. Uh, how we live our lives today makes a huge difference on how it will be for us tomorrow. Huge, huge thing. And if we can walk away from this study with that in mind, I think we will have achieved our goal. Okay? Uh, also, I want you to be disciplined in your thinking. Uh, disciplined in your thinking. I want you to look at everything from the perspective of eternity. Uh, and I'm talking about every aspect of how you live, from your time utilization uh, your finances, your prayer life, your worship, your child rearing, your retirement, every aspect about your life. I would like you to look at those things with eternity in mind because Jesus Christ would have you to do that. How we live our lives today is really important to tomorrow. And on our study today, I want today's study to bring comfort. I, I really do. Uh, I really do. Um, and we can experience God's comfort in our study today on heaven because of his attributes, because of his word, and because his son tells us what happens to our lost little children, to the ones that we have sent on before. Uh, very important study. I know to many in this room and to Granny and I as well. So as one of our final studies on heaven, today we're looking at uh, uh, the case for the children in heaven. And we started our study last week by looking at the the devastating power uh, of death and what was done by the Savior to overcome it. What he did to overcome it. Paul speaks about God's plan to abolish death in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse 10. There's a but. It starts with the word but there, but, and that's God's eternal plan. Those are my words I'm inserting there. Uh, is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ who hath abolished death. He abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light 
through the gospel. When Jesus Christ abolished death, that means he obliterated it. He obliterated it. Death is something to be feared is gone. It is gone. Uh, it's done. So we can conclude that death was overcome by Jesus Christ and no longer needs to be feared. Okay, that should be a firm conclusion for us as Christians, that it was overcome by Jesus Christ. How did he overcome death? How did he do that? By dying himself on the cross. Yes, and then rose, rose from the dead. He overcame it. So, um, I think as a nice added note, when we talk about heaven in the future, we see that death is eliminated altogether. It's no longer. It is no longer. Uh, it's gone. Even so, I think knowing that even as you know, Christians today, nothing grips our hearts like the loss of a loved one. Nothing grips our hearts like that. So, But without any trace of doubt, no trace of doubt, children who die go straight to heaven. Straight to heaven. Instantly, gloriously, and triumphantly. They are there. They bypass all the sorrows of earthly life um, and are transported directly into the presence of our Lord. And many of us in this room have children waiting for us on the other side. I think it's going to be an awesome time. Um, as I was... Uh, Kirsten. Sorry. Kirsten, I was just getting to the good part. <laughs> for me to pass up a chance to get Kirsten is just not going to happen. <laughs> The folks on the bubble probably didn't even hear the noise. What's that? The folks on the bubble probably didn't even hear the noise. <laughs> They're wondering what you're doing. <laughs> but, <laughs> probably. So you're wondering, probably, you know, or maybe you're not. I hope you don't. But if you are today, I hope you answer those questions. Why do I think that so strongly? Uh, that, uh, that our lost little children are in heaven with the Lord today. Well, the primary reason I believe this is because of the character of God, of the character of God. We know him through his word, his character, his personality, and his attributes. There's nothing, I think, more fulfilling than understanding the attributes of our great God. His attributes, we have a list of them. Shield Jude is their acronym. And you go down one by one and understand his attributes. And that list is really not even complete in and of itself. There are so many attributes there. He isn't a distant person with a, with a long uh, white beard and flowing white robes uh, who simply watches what's going on. He's our Father. He's our Father. When we grieve, He grieves. When we rejoice, He rejoices. When we feel lost, He feels lost too. So He's a Father, though, who has had some unique experiences. And on this subject, this is very important to me. He is a father who has had some unique experiences. God the Father experienced the loss of his only begotten son. And that makes God very sympathetic with us when we experience our losses. Uh, last week we looked at some of God's character traits regarding children. We saw that he is full of compassion, tenderness, mercy, and he carries us through life's tough patches like a father carrying his son. And if his tender mercies are over all his works, as he says they are, that certainly includes our children. God knows that the youngest of human beings can't understand the witness of God. They don't comprehend the truth of the gospel. And yet God, love, God loves them deeply with a, with a special and a tender care. Furthermore, According to the scriptures, life begins from the moment of conception. We talked about that last week. We saw that God knows and loves the unborn baby even in the womb. We saw that God calls our little ones innocent. And it's important to note that, uh, by the way, being innocent does not mean sinless, does it? Doesn't mean sinless. Um, God did not say children were without a sinful nature. Uh, this is when, when that child was conceived. Uh, Gus was bringing that out in Sunday school today. It's all a part of who we are. Uh, all you have to do is look at, uh, over a short period of time, a little child, and you're going to see the sin nature in action. 
It just is what it is. But while not sinless, I believe children, those little ones, are innocent in this respect. They are not yet responsible for their sin in the same way as those whose sins are willful and premeditated. They're just acting out their nature. They are what they are. God knows full well the human heart. And he also understands the stages of life. And in their stage of life, they're reacting by their nature and not by a willful decision to intentionally commit an act that they know is sin. These little guys, they're just going to be what they are. The one person that I probably feel most sorry for in the whole world is a, maybe a kindergarten teacher. You know? You got these, these little sinners, a whole classroom full of them. Um, <laughs> trying to steer them in a... Whoa, that's not for me. <laughs> but they volunteered for it. They volunteered. <laughs> Until they get a mortgage, Greg, and then they have to stay. <laughs> then they're stuck. But in all these ways, we can see that the character of God lays a foundation for the realization that children, and I also believe the mentally handicapped, uh, who don't understand the gospel, are covered by the grace and mercy of God. They are. Uh, a key question this always brings up then is, what is the basis for their salvation? Children who die uh, are not taken up into heaven on their own merits because they're innocent. No, these children are still born with a fallen nature. Uh, Psalms 51.5, Behold, this is David, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Children cannot save themselves or be saved by their own merits. I believe they're saved as we are, by the power of the blood of Christ. And they're included by grace in the infinite mercy of God, which is one of his characteristics. Robert P. Leitner wrote a great book on this. It's called Safe in the Arms of Jesus. And he said, in all the Bible references to infants, little children, and others who cannot believe, um, they're neither told to believe nor expected to do so. They are not classified as wicked, rejectors of God's grace. It is always adults who are addressed either directly or indirectly regarding these matters. And then Charles Spurgeon. Now, the, his whole quote is in your worksheet on this subject. Um, and Karen, I still have to add your email address to our worksheet list when I send out worksheets. So, uh, so please, if you don't see him coming, please remind me, okay? Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, Are infants saved? And if so, how? I answer, saved they are beyond a doubt. All children dying in infancy are caught away to dwell in heaven. But mark this. No infant was ever saved apart from the death of Christ. Christ Jesus has, with his blood, bought all those who die in infancy. We believe they are saved, every one of them without exception, but not apart from the one great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, it, it, I believe what he says is absolutely true. There is so much I don't understand about this subject. And you know, one thing I don't understand is why an innocent child even dies in the first place. I don't understand. Uh, my questions of that are, <laughs> you know, uh, God is probably going to deal with me like he does with Job. Um, you know, what are you thinking? Who's in charge here? Well, he is. Because um, he's not willing that any should perish. But I do conclude some things, and I'd like you to, I'm going to go down a quick list of six things and, uh, that I, from my study on this subject, I have come to some firm conclusions that, I, that within my heart I live by faith uh, to guide me through these losses. Number one, I believe the Bible is the only and one and only source to actually get God's answers about this question. The Bible is the only place to look. There are many good resources out there, no doubt, and I use them. As you guys can tell from all the quotes I use, I, I do. I use a lot of good resources uh, on that subject. But the Word of God is ultimately the only resource to work from on any question about life and death. It is the only resource. Is there any questions about what I'm saying? I am adamant on this. <laughs> if you look somewhere else, look for it for a reference, for help. But the Bible is the only resource on life and death 
that you can absolutely trust. It is the only one. All other study resources on any subject, subject, really, should be measured against the Word of God for validation. The Bible is it. That is it. And some of you have been very kind to me in providing me with your favorite books on heaven, and I truly appreciate it. I have enjoyed every one of them. They have expanded my library in a very special way. I would like to, and if anybody wants to, I have the coolest library in the world. Uh, it's up in my loft over in my garage, and uh, I have these roll-around carts that somebody was kind enough to get. They're full of the, these excellent books. It's, a, it's awesome. Um, out of all the books that I looked into on this, and I bought probably a dozen, and I was given some, and um, only one of the books that I came across that was, that was I identified to me as a must-read is fictional. And that is called The Omega Reunion. Has anybody heard of that book? The Omega Reunion. I had not, but a, but a very kind person recommended that book to me. It's written by Frank Carmichael. It's only 101 pages. It's a quick read. It is the story, uh, it's, a, it's a fictional story about heaven later on down the road. And it's about the Lord Jesus Christ setting up a, a recurring reunion with the 37. It's really a fascinating story. And the 37 are the young boys, the babies that were killed in Bethlehem. Fascinating story. So the Lord calls them together for a reunion periodically because of what they went through. They were killed because of him. Herod trying to kill the Lord Jesus. Really good, good story. And uh, I, had, I searched high and low. It's about $90 for this little book. So I didn't buy it. But then Dave found me a copy on um, eBay for a mere $10. So I own a copy. So if anybody wants to read this little book, uh, you can sign it out from me by leaving a substantial deposit. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to lose the book. So, what's that? Pay back the price of the book. That's right. So, there's a lot of good resources, but point number one for me, guys, uh, is that the Bible on matters of life and death is the ultimate and only source for true information. Um, I just, as, a, as, a, as I believe that wholeheartedly as my number one and maybe the most important point. Number two, I believe children who die before they understand their need for a savior, though they possess a sinful nature, are described in the Bible as innocent. Innocent, not held accountable for what they have done. They cannot yet understand the implications of good, evil, sin, death, heaven, hell, the cross of Christ. Those are concepts that they have not yet grasped. They are innocent. Uh, but they're covered by his love through the blood of Jesus Christ. So they'll be there. Number three, I believe when God judges the world, he will do right. I believe he will do right. The issue of God saving infants and uh, mentally disabled individuals I believe takes us to the very heart of God's character. God is what? Love. love. God is love. The very heart of his character. All those attributes of God are super important. My own opinion, uh, just an opinion. I think that one, love, as is his strongest attribute. All the other attributes are based on his love. Prior to conversion to Christ, most people go through a, a, a time of illumination. You know, the Spirit deals with your heart. And you come to a conclusion, I need a Savior. And as a result, we recognize really that most saved people have at least some understanding of sin and repentance and redemption through Christ and eternal life. Uh, but we also recognize that those of, I'm going to say, limited mental capacity, uh, such as infants, small children, individuals that are mentally uh, disabled, may be saved by grace without such understanding. They are covered by the blood of Christ. Those who don't understand accountability won't be held accountable. They won't be. 
Number four, I believe little ones lost to death are shielded by the blood of Christ, uh, who loves all little children. And I would include the mentally disabled there as well. Those that don't have the mental capacity uh, to understand those things. When they pass on, psh, instantly they are in the presence of God. We're fully cognizant of what's going on. And I believe this wholeheartedly, again, because of the character, the personality, and the attributes of God that I see displayed in the scriptures. And I know God is, is, uh, is to, for me, to know God is to, is to more fully know what he thinks in those situations. As you study those attributes, which maybe we will pause at some point and do again, go over those. But to know those attributes is to understand how God thinks in those situations. How does he think? Well, if you study his attributes in the scriptures, you get insight into how he thinks. So study his word. Get to know him better. I guarantee you, you'll like what you find. And you will start thinking like he thinks. Which I, I think is ultimately important. Point number five, and you guys know when I do a, a six-point outline, I blow away the three-point outline format that pastors are supposed to stick with, right? Mm -hmm. Number five, I believe for those who have lost little ones, you can rest assured that that little one bypassed all the sorrows of life and has gone immediately into the presence of God in heaven. Immediately, right there. You can have peace and, and comfort even in your grief today, uh, knowing that they're being taken care of and, uh, and that you're going to meet them someday. I was talking to, to Dave about this, and Dave, Dave mentioned the thought that for those of, of us who have children uh, on before us in heaven, somebody's going to come up to you on that day, and uh, when you get there, tap you on the shoulder and say, I'm that one, and I am uh, stoked. Granny is too. Um, in essence, what I'm saying, guys, is that we can grieve with knowledge. As Paul tells to the Thessalonians, we can grieve with knowledge. We need not grieve in ignorance. Um, and we can do it in a, in a view to the future rather than despair and living in the past. We can do it with great anticipation. Great anticipation. And number six. And you guys think I'm done after six points? No. There's a lot of data on this, and, and um, I, um, I take my role as a pastor very seriously, and I believe I will stand before God someday and answer for what I teach. And uh, I think in, in, um, in, in, in areas, subjects like this, he's going to ask me, why didn't you say whatever? I don't ever want to hear that from him. I want to hear... You know, uh, your folks were comforted by my word because of what you said. So that's why I said we're going to cover a lot of area on this. I believe fully and completely, number six, in the compassion of Jesus Christ toward children. And we'll study that shortly. As I was studying this subject, I came across a couple of interesting things. Two, two interesting studies that, that I devoured as I read them. And, and one of them was done by a group of scientists that issued a statement that from the beginning of recorded history, recorded history, from the time that we know, about 66% of everyone conceived in the womb did not survive to see age five. Did you know that to be the fact? And, and when, I, when I further checked this out, I believe it's true. Um, that means that two thirds of mankind have either died in the womb through miscarriage, stillbirth, abortion, early childhood diseases, crime, wars, accidents, nat nat natural disasters. 66% of the human race never saw age five. Thus, a, a large majority of all the people in heaven, guess what? redeemed by his automatic childhood coverage aspect of redemption. So, yes, sir. And their children. And their children. <laughs> Herb, you, it's, your calling up there might be running the nursery. I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't know. I said, my belief is that these, when they go to heaven, they become instantly mature. But uh, we'll know when we get there, because I don't have a real strong <laughs> biblical evidence to say that. But in our American society today, it's almost unheard of or even shocking when a child dies, isn't it? You, see, you just never, it's not common, uh, but it's not always been so. Uh, it's not always been that way. Right now, we're, we in America live in a very protected bubble and have a tainted view of this. People in other parts of the world, um, the, the, the losses of their children is a regular occurrence. It happens all the time. Many of them never reach uh, maturity. In fact, most of them don't. Um, another, the other report that shocked me when I was researching this subject was um, my ancestors came to the United States of America in 1862. Uh, they worked their way across the country, got to Chicago, and then went north and ended up settling in a little town called Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. Sleepy Eye is named after an Indian with a sleepy eye, uh, a Sioux Indian. Well, they bought, a, they bought a swamp, literally a swamp. They bought a swamp. They drained the water and turned it into farmland and became very, very good farmers, uh, very good farmers. But in 1877, that area, Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, became the hotbed of a diphtheria outbreak that hit its peak in 1880 across southern Minnesota. The disease hit kids very hard. The report that, that I found on it uh, just really surprised me. The Minnesota Historical Society. I have the report if anybody would like to read it. But they report that many families in that area were left with either none, one, two, or a very, on rare exceptions, three of their children. All their other children died in this diphtheria outbreak. I, there wasn't anybody left. Uh, the, the report mentioned Fred Gerboth and his wife. They had six kids, five girls and a boy. They lost all five girls. Just psh, went right through. And within a week, they were all dead. Uh, another family, uh, Lewis Hansen. He lived about five miles southeast of Sleepy Eye, my hometown. And they had five kids. At the end of the scourge, they had none. Whole families wiped out. Whole families wiped out. And their story was very common. Uh, and it, the, the estimates on the loss of children doesn't even include all the Sioux Indians that were around them. That must have, it just must have devastated the Indian tribe there too. Well, where did all these children go? These little <coughs> children. They're all in heaven with the Lord right now. They really are. That's where, I believe because of the character of God that those among that number who had not reached an age of accountability are in heaven today. They're in heaven today. Uh, so, I believe beyond any doubt, because of God's attributes <clears throat> and His Word, that each and every one of our lost little children and our mentally disabled are in heaven with God. Um, there's another reason that I believe heaven is filled with our children that were lost when they're young, and that is the compassion of Jesus Christ, His compassion. He had an incredible love for children. Uh, let's, start, let's look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse 14. He says, Even so, or meaning for sure, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So Jesus will one day fix this fallen world with a new one. I'm looking forward to that, but in the meantime, we all live with the uh, consequence of our sin. And one of the consequences of sin is death. And death affects our little ones as well. Their death is not God's fault. He takes the blame, but they are not His fault. It is our own. Because it's not God's will that death comes to our little ones, but is a direct result of the fall. But God's redemptive plan has a coverage clause, which is awesome when you talk about uh, health insurance these days, right? for these little ones. They're covered by the blood of Christ. And in the new heaven and new earth, death will be eliminated for all eternity. Matthew 19, 13. Then were there brought unto him little children, and he put his hands on them and prayed. That's what they wanted him to do. And the disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. 
And if 66% of our human race has been lost before age five, that's a very true statement, right? Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Mark had some things to say about this as well. Mark 10, 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was, he was pretty mad, said he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Luke said, Luke said it too, Luke 18, 15. And they brought unto him also infants, that he should touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Uh, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, or let them come. Let them, let them bring them. Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And Jesus would continue to teach them about his heart for children. Just to give you some insight into his thought on this, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. Matthew 18 and verse 1. And at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and sat him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, become as, a, as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, that child was an infant, innocent, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. So the Lord used his view of the heart of little children to tell us how our heart should be. Let me repeat a verse we read earlier in our study, Matthew 18, 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And really, this says all I need to hear. Uh, Jesus had an eternal concern, care, and compassion for children. Well, how about children who die at some point prior to birth? Um, I believe a child is a person from the moment of conception. A child is a person. Uh, I think that many of you would know way more about this than me. I watched a few of our kids be born, and uh, that's all I need to know, right? All I need to know. And, uh, and when it came to my grandkids, I didn't need to be there at all. Praise the Lord. Um, but I believe that a child is a person from the moment of conception. Since that's true, I believe all pre-born babies who perish go instantly to heaven. Instantly to heaven. So if you've lost a child during pregnancy, you will someday meet that child in heaven. And I'm excited that we have some in our church actively working in the anti-abortion ministry. Uh, I know they believe, as, as I do, that if someone has had an abortion, that's not the end. That baby's in heaven. And those parents can meet that child there if they give their hearts to the Lord here and now. And I know with, uh, with Victoria, they bring back big time numbers of moms and some dads who have found the Lord through that disaster, that they have come to the Lord. So what we're talking about, by the way, also, this thought on, on, um, on the loss of babies and going to heaven is not new Christian doctrine. Uh, those thoughts and beliefs have been with us from the very beginning, from, from, well, from the words of Christ. An amazing document was dug up by archaeologists back in, uh, it was written in A.D. 125 by, I believe, a general officer uh, named uh, Arist Aristides, and he was writing to the Roman Emperor Hadrian. And this is what he said as he describes Christians. If any righteous person of their number passes away from the world, they rejoice and thank God and escort his body as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. When a child is born to one of them, they praise God. If it dies in infancy, they thank God the more as for one who has passed through the world without sins. This was in 125 AD. They believed as we believe today, an infant child that dies goes straight into the very presence of God. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts. And I joined those early believers in Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus Christ loves every baby. Um, he loves each one from conception, and in fact, I think he loves them from the foundation of the world. 
I really do. So I believe we can conclude, and I'll close with this, I guess, today, um, that the character of God, the condition of salvation, the compassion of the Savior, all point to the fact that babies who die before they're old enough to understand the gospel, or those that die in the womb before they can even be physically born, go right to heaven. Every one of them. Every one of them. And um, I, I hope that uh, fills your plate with lots of hope. That would be my desire. And uh, next week we'll close out this subject with a case study. And we're going to call it the case of King David's sin. And look what he went through and what he uh, uh, experienced in this way. So if you want to read ahead, 2 Samuel chapter 12 is our study. Any closing thoughts? So far I've done all the speaking. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you were speaking about um, commentaries or books other than the Bible. Those books are basically theory and opinion. They're not inspired. Right, they are not inspired. And that's why I say, you know, my point number one is my main point. Uh, when you talk about death, when you talk about life, when you talk about any aspects of human life, the Bible is the only source of inspired direction from God. There are many good sources out there. Uh, you know, fine people have written many good books. I don't argue that for a second. But they should all be measured against the Bible to make sure that they're accurate and good and, uh, and on target. Yes, sir? You're asking, uh, one of your questions is, why does God let children die? The verse in uh, Isaiah 57, uh, verse 1, that kind of relates to that. It says, The righteous perisheth, and no one layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, and unconsidering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Yeah. That's so, a benefit. Yeah, so, you know, we're not thinking about that. You know, God is delivering a child from, you know, evil that would have happened in their life if they, you know, continue to live. Yeah. And, you know, now they're in his presence, so. Right, right. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. I, uh, I see the grief sometimes, though, as being very heavy. And, uh, and human speaking, humanly speaking, the answers to that grief are just not found. No, there is not. Yes, sir. That being said, every soul of every human being has been considered and thought of by God. He's deciding who should stay on this earth to not face that sin or that evil, and he's deciding which soul on this earth is okay to stand the evil. But every soul has been thought about. Yeah, he, there's not a single one he has forgotten or didn't think about. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if, how many people are on the earth today? Like six billion? It's like eight billion. Eight billion? Well, the, the, the guys who do the numbers, crunch numbers, say that approximately, humanly speaking, 88 billion human beings have been conceived. There might be eight billion on the world, to, in the earth today. But total, 88 billion have been conceived from Adam and Eve to today. Which is a lot of folks, right? <laughs> it's a lot of people for the Lord to keep up with. But he does it with trivial. I mean, it's not a challenge for him. But 88 billion is a lot. Well, yes, sir? Every star, I mean. Yeah, and how many stars are there? We don't know. Probably more than 88 billion. Right, maybe we've all got a star named after us, Herb. I don't know. It could be that. So, anybody else? So someday, you know, it's just, you'll get that tap on the shoulder and say, I'm, I'm the one you lost. And I think it will be very, very, very special. Very special. So, all right, let's pray. Oh, anybody on the bubble? Got any closing comments? I forgot about the bubble. Okay. Lord, we ask that you would bless our, our church. Uh, we are looking to grow and uh, spiritually speaking, we want to have hearts that, um, that truly understand your attributes and then use that knowledge um, as an introduction to who you are. 
how you think, how we should think, and then how we should act. And we're asking that you uh, bless us mightily in that way. Uh, thanks for your word, the comfort that it brings. I cannot fathom uh, a lost and dying world who have also lost their infants, their little ones, who would reject you and then walk away from an opportunity to know their ones that they had sent on before. I cannot understand that. I don't get it. Uh, asking, Lord, that we would be evangelistic in our outreach, as Jose said, uh, in his song service. And, uh, and we're asking, Lord, that if there be anybody here today, in the sound of my voice, uh, who has heard the word, that they would put their faith in you for their eternal destiny, that they would see their need, that they would trust you, and today, Lord, that it would be today. And that you would break their heart through your spirit about their spiritual need. Asking, Lord, that that person, our persons, whoever they are, would then have the boldness and the, uh, the fortitude to come forward and let the world know that they have made a decision for you. That they put their faith in you. Asking now this week you give us opportunities to speak of you. There will be those out there who have sent on uh, loved ones before, infants, even the unborn. Uh, and and, and in, in our evangelism, may the knowledge that we pick up from your word on this very subject give us the tools we need to reach some uh, for your name. And for the great comfort that it gives us, we are so thankful. And we do pray all this in your name, Lord. Amen. Thank you, everybody. How you doing, Kim? You doing good?